Hi, I'm Chris Howard. I'm the Chief of Research at Gartner, and this is Top of Mind. This is a second part of a series where I'm thinking about generative AI. Last time we talked a little bit about what, what is it and why is it so interesting, ideas about the uncanny valley and so on. What I want to talk about for a few minutes today is the shift from fascination to implementation. It's very much what I'm seeing in our clients and in fact what Gartner is doing itself. We've come through a period of trying to understand what it is and then really now starting to think about, well, what do we do with it? And as I've been preparing for this, you know, what we're doing at Gartner over the last couple of weeks, I've gone back and been rereading some things that were really influential on me as a young software developer ages ago, like in a different life ago. But that was the work of Christopher Alexander and Design Patterns, some work from Terry Winograd that was one of the early thinkers in, uh, in artificial intelligence, uh, who I worked with at Stanford a little bit, and his ideas around speech and symbolic systems and so on. Pretty arcane stuff, actually. But I want to actually put it in focus for us because I think it's really important at this time in our history as we reckon with humans and technology. The first thing is that language itself is a technology and writing as an aspect of language is something that as far as we know is unique to, to humans. And it actually is part of our, you know, it's clearly the way that we communicate with one another. And what's changing right now is it's becoming the way that we communicate with machines. Now, we have done this through coding and things like that. But of course, right now we're communicating in English with machines. I saw a stat the other day to be determined whether it's actually true or not, but it's provocative in that the most common coding language right now is English, as opposed to like C Sharp or Java or things like that. Now, it's provocative because generative AI can be used to actually generate code as well. So this the idea of language and interaction is a really powerful thing for us because it allows us to have a deeper connection to the things around us. And increasingly that is the compute that we're using uh, to do complex tasks. So Terry Winograd spoke about speech acts. So informing our technology through speech acts and so on, which I think is what we're experiencing right now. He also wrote about the representation of text and other things in symbolic languages or symbolic representation, which of course is the foundation of the foundational models. So we use language to communicate with our technology increasingly, but it's not quite as magical as that. And that's, this is the place where those things that we've been so interested in because it seems to be human start to peel the covers off of that and figure out how it really works. Most companies that are experimenting with some form of chat GPT or, or similar are doing it using a technique called prompt engineering. So a prompt is basically a query that then interacts with the systems behind it to pull back the information that, that is required. Uh, maybe a way to think about this. So we have Australian shepherds. have had shepherds for the longest time. You think about an Australian shepherd is like packed with potential. It comes out genetically predisposed to herd everything that it sees, including people and cats and ducks and cattle and everything like that. So it has this sort of innate ability but it requires shaping in order for it to be productive. You give them language cues, you take them out into the field and you train them and so that they learn exactly what the task is. And then something interesting happens is that there are emergent properties that, that begin to appear where they solve problems on their own. But it took that combination of their innate ability and a shaping and a direction to actually accomplish the outcome that, that you seek. The same is true with prompt engineering. You could ask a simple question to a chat interface and it'll give you a reasonable answer. But prompt engineering allows you to actually put more context in, like use five bullet points and use a very formal language and don't be offensive, you know, or speak in the style of, or as if you're speaking to a 12 year old. These types of things you actually inject into the prompt. And then a lot of what happens next is you search on information. So you may be searching on information inside your enterprise and it pulls that context or that text back into the prompt and then bounces it against the GPT or the large language model. And so the large language model, as I talked about before, teaches it how to speak. So that's like the, the dog with all its innate capabilities, but you're framing what you want it to do based on what you've given it in the prompt. And then you get a much better result at the end. What's starting to happen now that I find this really interesting is you can actually become more outcome oriented. So you, you're asking the system for the outcome that you desire and it designs the prompts. This is all moving so quickly. It's really fascinating. Reminds me of a poem from Donald Hall, that, again, one of the books I went back to and read uh, from a poem called The Tree, and I'll paraphrase. At the end of it, he says, a tree is an engine for becoming itself in the dirt and the sun. 
And that's really a bit what AI is like right now, and it's fascinating. So let me give you an example of what a prompt like this might be. Let's say I am a technician working on a factory floor with sophisticated equipment. And of course, the equipment has a lot of data around it. There are procedures for working on the floor, just like tons of information. And what this technology is particularly good at is asking for a summary or a perspective based on lots of data. And it gives you in common language, maybe the solution to a problem or the next step that you should take. And some of that information coming from the machinery itself, so that might be a data source, or coming from standard operating procedures, which are text-based and then coming in. And so I'm able to ask a simple question. The prompt takes care of all the complexity of that and then brings me back an answer that helps me to make an action. That's the kind of outcome that, that companies are trying to seek. And it's as true for people that make and move stuff like the person on the floor as it is for people that are information workers looking for some of data visualizations, visualizations and that kind of thing. But when it comes to building this, what I'm doing is looking at design patterns. So this takes me back to the work of Christopher Alexander I mentioned before. So he talked about design patterns for building cities and towns and how patterns would repeat. And it was very influential in software development and software engineering uh, many years ago. But the same concept applies here. So if my goal is to present that information to the factory worker, there are data sources attached to it. So a design pattern would show, okay, here's the user and the interface that they're working with. Here's the prompt and where it interacts. And then here's where it talks to a data source and here's where it talks to the large language model. So a high level representation to show the pieces that fit together. I actually used this with a client in their board meeting yesterday to help them understand what they were likely looking to, to build. But there's another layer below that that Gartner's also working on called a reference architecture, where you actually are very detailed about the types of databases that need to be used, the points of integration, the nature of the user interface itself, which may actually be a non-human interface. It may be an interface into some other system. And so we're building out a technical representation of how this thing that seems so human is actually going to work. And that's as we move from fascination about what this is, what this technology is that's gripped us so in such an interesting way to the true mechanics of building it so that it can produce the outcomes that maybe lead people to a better action, a better decision, keep them safe, or to interact with a customer or a client or a patient or a student. That's the promise of this. And that's where we'll go in the next episode is actually looking at use cases across industries to show how industries are being disrupted and things are changing for the good, but maybe also for the bad. I'm Chris Howard, this has been Top of Mind. Join me again in a couple of weeks and we'll keep going.